My name is Rich Schmidt. It is Friday, June 23rd, 2017. We're here at Nicholson Library with Nancy Daniel, uh, former owner of Canary Hill Vineyards. And Nancy, we'll start you off with a nice easy question, which is why wine? Why wine? Uh, just dumb luck. <laughs> dumb, uh, we moved from Arizona where we had raised our children back to the Northwest, which was where we met and are from, because my husband, uh, after 20 years in the electronics business was tired of corporate life and he said I want to do something I mean we were looking for, for something that would be satisfying work for him and we made offers on about two or three businesses which were fortunately turned down <laughs> we, we would have gone in the hole faster than you know <laughs> Growing up, he had uncles in the Palouse country in Washington, uh, and he was driving tractor when he was 11 years mm -hmm. old, and he could, he could drive anything. And so we figured, we, settled, we interviewed cities up and down the coast, and we had separate ballots, and only, you know, one no vote would, so we, we unanimously, separately decided on the Willamette Valley, mm -hmm. partly because of the land use laws, which allowed small acreages and that's about what we could afford and um, after our forays into small business we decided well something with a tractor would make him happy <laughs> and I have been growing things since I was three years old and I figured I know how stuff grows and he knows everything else so we started looking for vineyards and and we were in a bank reading some ag publication and we saw the two Bethel Heights couples in a photograph with their children mm -hmm. who were young. And we had all this chutzpah. We just called them up and said, can we come out and will you just tell us everything you know? <laughs> <laughs> and we, we had really a lot of gall. We literally wrote down all these questions and uh, uh, some years later, Ted sent it back to me <laughs> and I thought, oh, what, what nerve we had. <laughs> At least you picked the right people to ask. Uh, but yes, they were very gracious and uh, we, they, it was in the middle of spring pruning we went out and uh, uh, they put down their pruners and we walked up and sat on the porch at Ted and Pat's house and we had some of Terry's homemade wine. And we looked out at that beautiful vista and said, hmm, think we can get used to this. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So that's how we entered the wine. We didn't know anything about wine. I put Gallo Hardy Burgundy on the, th on the Thanksgiving table. I mean, that's what I know about wine. <laughs> um, so we went through a long uh, search for land, uh, uh, drove all over about three counties. and. Seely and Winquist, uh, Ron Seely, and and uh, I th that name will come up. They they were they spent a fair. One of them was, was a realtor, and, and the other one did have some ag background. And they were busy identifying a, appropriate vineyard land, thinking that they would find out of state buyers, and then they would manage the mm -hmm, vineyards. Mm -hmm. Uh, that didn't work out, but they did identify good vineyard land, and um, so that's how we found the piece on Canary Hill that we that we bought. So I have uh, to back up for a second and ask yeah. you. You say so you, you're talking about knowing how to grow things, and, and and your husband knowing how to drive a tractor, and then you went right to vineyards. Why vineyards and not filberts or okay, so cherries? My my standard was it ha it can't be bigger than I am. <laughs> <laughs> so we considered blueberries, but I couldn't relate to the filberts. But those those three crops you could grow on a small acreage. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Interesting. Um, and we didn't have enough finances to buy a large piece of, of ground. Okay. So um, this was just right after the land use laws were passed, and Clarence Primus was the farmer that we bought the land from, and he, I mean, he had acres and acres and was had been there since the 1800s <laughs> and that was his retirement plan was to chop up and sell off oh, his land interesting. And, and he was fairly upset about the land use laws so 
Anyway, he, d he divided off some two or three 20 acre parcels and we bought one of them. So. How did you know when you had found the right place? Well, we, uh, we had looked at, uh, D D Dick was uh, an engineer by training, but he started out as an archi in architectural design and, and he was very good, good at researching. Mm -hmm. So we looked at soils and, uh, and we listened to what uh, the Bethel Heights people told us. And, and, and Ted ga gave us a lot of information about uh, what kind of soils were good and, mm -hmm. and, and he recommended the uh, General Vitt, a, a, a textbook that uh, was out of UC Davis. And uh, so he, he, Dick read everything. <laughs> and I, I don't know how we, grapes just sounded sort of like what we wanted to do. Mm -hmm. You have to live on a hill, you know? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. True. <laughs> and uh, and the, the reigning wisdom at the time was that 20 acres would support two people. Okay. Not. <laughs> and uh, that's, that's how we settled on it. Rather than, I mean, we talked to a blueberry farmer. Mm -hmm. I don't think it was another, I don't know that there's another small acreage crop that has high, high value. Nothing comes to mind, no. Yeah. We, did, we did think about blueberries. But grapes, we met, really, the people that we met were hardly, none of them were, very few are from the agriculture industry. I mean, there were pilots and doctors mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. people from all professions. Blueberries, you're talking to farmers, mm -hmm. you know. Sure. Which is fine, but, but the, the, the intellectual range is broader when you're, and the, the mindset is different. And so we just felt very comfortable with the people we met and uh, sounded like a great, great lifestyle, which is what it turned out to be, a great lifestyle. You can't make money out of it. <laughs> <laughs> but at least you have fun. Until you sell it. That's right, that's yeah. right. Yeah. So what did the so you moved into the Ola Hills? Mm -hmm. What did the Ola Hills look like when you uh, when you started? Uh, it it was pretty much uh, grass seed farmers and the and the hills. Uh, the, the piece of ground that we bought had, was just grazing land that he ran sheep on it. It was a mixed grass pasture. Mm -hmm. So a lot of vineyards I think had been orchards and they had to clear. We didn't have to clear the land, which was very helpful. Mm -hmm. Um, it was uh, wheat and grass seed, and um, I, th I think going west from our hill, it's a lot of flatland, and uh, I think there was a fair amount of grass seed from, I didn't pay any attention, I really didn't know. <laughs> <laughs> so other, other than Bethel Heights, who else was out there? Who else was out there? Well, we, there were several couples that started vineyards right about the same time and we, in the Eola Hills area and uh, well Ted and Pat and and Terry and Marilyn were the they were the anchors mm -hmm. and uh, then um, Freedom Hill started mm -hmm. the Duches and um, Pat and Patty O'Connor uh, Patty has since passed away and, and he's sold a vineyard, but it was O'Connor Vineyard, which is now Zena, right on, on uh, Zena Road. Mm -hmm. And uh, Al McDonald and Joni Weatherspoon started. Mm -hmm. so, and there were, that's five couples. Sometimes um, Mark Vlasic was, was included, but we just had, we had parties and, and we did, we had, some of them had kids in school, ours were in college, and, and we had holidays together and we had I was uh, since I've just moved. I'm cleaning out and go. And I, we had a party that we called the the Bud Break Bash, and uh, I I I drew a a grape cluster mm -hmm. for the invitation, and I put three clusters on it because that was really a big year if you had three clusters <laughs> on it. <laughs> um, so those vineyards started, and then we met, met the Viscontis, but mm -hmm. they ran in a little bit different circle. Um, it, it was 
Well, oh, and the Carters, um, their, their um, vineyard was a quarter of a mile up the road, and, and they lived in town because they had school kids mm -hmm. and uh, worked for the state, and then Jack started uh, an advanced degree in psychology. Or, um, so we managed or th their vineyard, mm -hmm. and, and uh, they were busy people. It, it looked like farmland, mm -hmm. you know. There were uh, a lot of filberts mm -hmm. and uh, just Willamette Valley Farm. Not not <laughs> too many not too many vineyards. Sure. Um, we made the trip up Oak Grove Road often, which turned into dirt eventually, and and ended up at, at Zena Road mm -hmm. and. Yeah. Uh, uh, not not farmers and yeah. So there's a good name behind how you became Canary Hill Vineyard, right? Oh uh, well, yeah. The question is, what do we name the place? And um, when we arrived, because it was a mixed grass pasture, um, there were lots of seed heads, and Dick was building what he called the test building, the barn. We were renting a little house in in uh, West Salem, and. Here are all these little yellow birds, and we lost, asked the locals, what, what are they? And they said, oh, those are wild canaries. So we named it Canary Hill, destroyed their habitat, and then named it for them. <laughs> uh, but they're actually the western goldfinch. <laughs> <laughs> there was a single oak tree down on the fence line to the north of the property, and I was not very inventing. I was calling it, let's call it the Lone Oak Vineyard. Well. I think that name got taken later I think on. It did, yes. <laughs> yeah. Canary Hill has a good ring to it. Yeah, though. yeah. Nice. Well, Canary Hill is good. Yeah. Because um, when we, it's not after a place. It's not, right. you know. Mm -hmm. So we we literally owned the, owned the name. Mm -hmm. I can't remember if we registered. I think we did register it. Yeah. So once you bought the once you bought in and you started, how did you go about the business of learning grapes specifically? Uh, General Vit, and then we we had um, the growers meetings, which is where everybody in the valley went. That was you've probably heard it's. I think it recently got a, an official name, but, it's, but Don Byard started it, mm -hmm. uh, and he. Well, Bethel Heights people said, if you want to learn, you should go to these meetings because nobody knew anything and we all just shared everything. Mm -hmm. and, and we met in a, in a wine shop uh, at, in South Salem at, at around uh, Pringle Plaza, mm -hmm. owned by um, a, a guy named Nathan Allen, who, uh, and after we had our discussion, it was just, who has things to buy and who has things to sell and who has questions or sometimes we'd have a speaker but oftentimes we just talked about what's going on in our vineyards and then after the meeting we'd have a blind tasting that mm. Nathan organized and really bottles in in sacks and uh, uh, which is how I learned about lime, wine um, we it was very formal we made notes and sniffed and talked and mm -hmm. uh, so it was, uh, it was uh, a learning on the job. Um, there's not all that much to learn about. I mean, you read, read about grapes. They send, the, they send. We didn't irrigate. They send their roots down as far as they can go. Mm -hmm. They don't want to die. Mm -hmm. You know, some things want to die. Azaleas, they like to die. <laughs> Cherry trees, sure. Not so much. Uh, we, we had interviewed uh, Yakima, Washington, which is farmland. And we talked to a cherry grower there, and, and the wo the woman she said, "Don't ever grow cherries. They <laughs> they are looking for a reason to die." <laughs> so, uh, great. The question is just how, how do you lay it out? And, and it was there was no phylloxera in the state at mm -hmm. that point, so we we bought bundles of sticks, fifty cents a piece, st stuck them in the ground, and they they grew roots. So it was it was. Pretty much a mechanical process in the beginning, and uh, you read General Vit, and it says you prune them down to two buds the first year, and then you train them up, and it, it you know, 
It, it wasn't too hard. <laughs> <laughs> it's, the question is how to manage them and, mm -hmm. and what sprays. And you don't need to fertilize grapes. Sure. Um, uh, yeah, it's it's running the vineyard is is the the key, and and that that was Dick's bailiwick mm -hmm. because you got to drive a tractor, you know, <laughs> <laughs> sure, sure. And, and run run the sprayer and know when to put the sprays on and. And when we decided grapes were to be our, our new livelihood, we sat down and crunched numbers until we got the right answer. Mm -hmm. We did not make assumptions and say, well, there's the answer. No, we, ha we had the answer. And then we made assumptions and changed them until we got the, the answer we wanted. And Dick would never admit that, but I mean, really for about 10 days, that's all we did every day. And we assumed crop price and, and crop level and, and spray cost. And, and one of the assumptions was that we could do all the labor, the two of us. Hmm. Not so, <laughs> no, no. Uh, within a short time, it became clear somebody needed a, a day job. And so that became me. And, and so you were working a day job. And, I was working in town, yeah. And, and also helping on the vineyard. Oh, yeah, oh. yeah. Come home at night, working on weekends. Sure, yeah. sure. Yeah. So what were some of the other challenges uh, in sort of running a vineyard, owning a vineyard? I don't know. I don't think there were any. It was just, it was just party time all day. <laughs> it, was, it was, you work hard, and then you play hard. It, it was just great fun. Yeah. Partly because this gang we ran around with. Mm -hmm. I can't. Th I can't think of any challenges. We had to. We had to sell the grapes, mm -hmm. and we did that for the first. We. You just pour money into a vineyard, and I hope it's. I remember writing on my Christmas letter the first year. It's like sending a child to college. You just keep pouring money in and hope something good comes out. <laughs> And it takes a probably four years. We had our first full crop after five years. It's a really good analogy. And so the the challenge was was the, the money flow, the doll, you know, uh, the uh, un until we actually had a crop to sell. Sure. And and it was a time when people ha made handshakes. We didn't have many written contracts. And it was it was a lot of, a lot of trust and some. On one occasion, we didn't get paid. Mm -hmm. Other people had that experience. So the challenges were not so much growing the crop. I mean, it, they just grow. Mm -hmm. And um, it was managing it and, and selling the grapes. Uh, our first full crop we sold to Dickie Rath. And I was charged with making the crop estimate and the formula was every mm, I think third or fourth row and every tenth plant you stop and you count the clusters and it was supposed to be random and so we thought we had whatever it was and then we went through and thinned so that we thought we were producing three tons to the acre and that's what we sold to Dickie Rath. Harvest time came and we, we we delivered as much as we had a contract for, and there was still fruit on the vine. <laughs> and Dick was not only a good winemaker, he was a very good businessman, and he said, well, I think I can probably take that fruit off your hands, <laughs> but maybe a little bit lower price. <laughs> and as it turned out, we ripened in the fifth year, and this was 1985, which was a very hot year probably the hottest on record at that point, um, five tons to the acre oh on, on a new vineyard. Yeah. Wow. So uh, there was always a lot of discussion about what the, cr the proper tonnage was. And, mm -hmm. and it became very popular to just thin, after you did your estimate, to thin. And I thought, geez, you're throwing good wine on the ground. You, you're going to have to harvest it one way or another. But so you had labor cost, and at that point, um, we had uh, 
entered into a long-term agreement with Ken Wright. Dick served on the Wine Advisory Board, and that's and he and, and Ken met each other at the same time. They were as different as salt and pepper in personality, but they really bonded and got along. So we we entered into this long-term contract with, with Ken Wright, and we had two other contracts. And with this limited crop thing, which I always wanted to argue about, uh, we said, okay, we'll sell you this fruit for X dollars an acre, and you can have whatever tonnage you want and we'll thin it once. And if that's not enough, you get to pay for the other thinning. So that, I, I think we might have been the first with an acre, per acre contract mm -hmm. instead of by, by the ton. Interesting. And our other two contracts, one with Willamette Valley Vineyards and the other with, with Christum. And uh, I can't remember whether we, I think, I think we sold by the ton to everybody. I mean, by the acre the to acre. everybody. How did, when it came to selling grapes, did you find people were seeking you out to buy your grapes, or were you doing more trying uh, to find buyers? We were looking for buyers, uh, and early on, uh, the acre, acreage was um, some Pinot Noir and some Chardonnay, and then we tried some Pinot Gris. And the, in, in order to sell the Pinot Noir early on, Many people said, "If you want my Chardonnay, you have to buy the Pinot Noir." Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And uh, of course, that that flip -flops, switched, yeah. flip flopped eventually. <laughs> um, so yeah, we ha we had we were looking for buyers, and that's where the 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 growers meeting came in. And uh, somebody ran, I th I think it might have been OWA ran a, a an exchange where people could say call in who's buying and who's selling. I think there was a, uh, I know somebody ran it, and, but I think it was ODBA, mm -hmm. I'm not sure. Um, and by word of mouth, and eventually, you know, if, if you find a good, after about uh, maybe two or three full crops, we had long-term contracts and we didn't have to go selling it anymore. I know some people just sell their crop every year, but, sure. but we, ha we had a long-term relationship with Willamette Valley and um, Kristen and, and Ken. Did you ever make your own wine or consider making your own wine? Once. Once? <laughs> Once. Uh, didn't study up on winemaking and uh, we crushed the grapes and put it in barrels and waited. No sulfur, no nothing. I, I tell people I used it as weed killer later on. <laughs> it, it, it was very sour and it, yeah, just a couple of barrels we thought, well let's try this. and. Uh, the, neither one of us had any any interest in becoming winemakers. We we were we were farmers. Interesting. Interesting. Yeah. That's kind of unique. Not 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 totally unique. But most people who were growing grapes also had some sort of dream of making wine. It seems. Yes. Yes. A lot. Many of them have come to the to the business because they have a passion for wine. Mm -hmm. And uh, you and then they become grapes. winemakers, and they're going to make the very best Pinot Noir on the on the state of the on the planet, sure. Um, sure. or or whatever other variety. Yeah, no, no, it was it was the fact that you had to live on a hill with a great view, and his bucket list included I want to build my own house, so he did, and. Um, I have to have dirt to play in, and so I had a, a, a virtual, I mean, the vineyard, he ran the vineyard, and I had the rest of it. I did the landscaping, and I had a dozen fruit trees, and, and uh, raised bed, vegetable beds, and uh, um, so it, it was a great, great lifestyle. Nice, nice. Not a lot of extra money, but um, it, it was sufficient. Mm -hmm. And uh, And so, um, and then at some point you sold, you guys decided to sell the vineyard. Right. Uh, when I had put in enough time at the state of, with the state of Oregon that I could retire early with full pension benefits, I did it. Uh, so at 58, mm -hmm. I retired. And I, they had offered a, a deferred compensation package, which I signed up for. And so we, we lived on that deferred compensation that, and, until I 
qualified for Social Security. And uh, at that point, uh, Dick said, well, when am I going to get to retire? And I said, I didn't think farmers ever did, so figure it out, darling. <laughs> and uh, he never paid himself anything, just enough to, to fund uh, an IRA. Mm -hmm. And so he, he sharpened his pencils and this is said, this is how much time I spend and this is, and he, fi he figured it out. And, and then he shopped it as, would you, we want to lease it so that you farm it. And he shopped it to all of our three contracts. And uh, um, the other two wanted, well, Willamette Valley had, as Willamette Valley has done for a long time, they are, they expand and, and they had a lot on their plate and um, weren't able to go into that at the time and the others wanted to argue about clauses and Ken said sounds good <laughs> <laughs> and um, we had no idea who the vineyard manager would be we um, if it had been closer to home it, we knew who the vineyard manager would be but um, it worked out and uh, so Dick got to train the vineyard manager. That's pretty cool. <laughs> in the, in the way he wanted it done. Sure. Yeah. And it had to make you feel pretty good that Ken was so ex was excited to buy your vineyard. Yeah. And yeah. see, and and the, then I never thought I'd ever leave the place. And he Dick was some years older, and I, and he was a smoker, and he he had had um, triple bypass surgery when he was 62, and I always figured I'm going to be the last one standing, and. I will probably just die up in the garden with my boots on. Mm -hmm. um, but he was ready to, to, he wanted to travel and, and see the world. Mm -hmm. and so we, and my back started giving out. I said I was in yoga, <laughs> I did yoga for a long time. So I said I was in garden position too long. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so I agreed to sell, but when we did the lease contract, it, it, it was with a provision we could always lease back the house. I mean, Ken didn't care what he had. I kept saying, <laughs> and he, he remembers, what are you going to do with the house? What are you going to do with the house? <laughs> because I designed it. Dick built it, but I designed it. Sure. And, and, and I had all these gardens. and uh, So... Um, that was that was easy that we could rent it and stay there forever and ever, but as it turned out, when we were ready to sell, I was ready to leave, and uh, and so he figured out what to do with the house. <laughs> so while you were in the industry, I know you were involved in some different uh, sort of committees and events, activities, activities right, exactly. Right, so tell because us about some I'm of those. going to town every day, working nine to five, eight to five, whatever, and Dick is on the wine advisory board and I was afraid, you know, I wanted to keep my oar in. And so I, I said, I volunteered for all kinds of things that I knew nothing about. <laughs> but, uh, I, so I worked with Bar Barney Watson mm -hmm. uh, on the state fair mm -hmm. and um, used state resources badly. I, I mean, I used their, I did wine business on the phone. I used their copy machines. <laughs> <laughs> um, but it's all, all for a good cause. And so the State Fair was the only judging. And I, and I, we had, uh, we got some big names, um, which I now forget. Mm -hmm. But Barney knew who to ask to, to have, come and have judges. And at one point, uh, while I was, I think I did that for a couple of years, maybe three, um, at some point, I, and I was working at the employment division and they had an auditorium and mm -hmm. I, I reserved it for state business because it was a state fair. And we put on a marketing seminar for uh, f during the, the fair time. And one of the speakers that we, we had uh, come, oh, now I'm gonna forget his name. He was the sommelier of Windows on the World, which was the largest wine collection in the in the country mm. probably in the world and it was based at the top of the twin towers oh my the, goodness of the gracious. world trade center right and his name was <laughs> but i mean 
it was a, a big name, mm -hmm. and, and he, so he came and gave a marketing seminar in Little Old Salem, Oregon to our local winemakers. That's and so cool. Yeah, yeah. So that was in the mid-80s that you were setting yeah, up the State Fair? Yeah, in the mid-80s. And so that was the kind of the first in-state judging? Uh, oh, it was the only in-state oh. judging, and it was before IPNC was established. Mm -hmm. And I, I think it, it was um, Bill Blosser that was the impetus for IPNC. But um, there were, if, if you wanted to have, you had to send your wine out of state or, or enter the State Fair. That was the only thing going for a while. So that marketing, uh, and I, I think I bent a few rules by calling it state business, but I think it was state business anyway. I, I, I was able to reserve that that space. Part of the state fair. I'm trying to think of his name, yeah. Big name. I, I, I was just back east at, because I have a daughter in Connecticut, and we went in to the 9-11 museum, mm -hmm. and, and I, I could say his name then. <laughs> It'll pop up at some point. It'll come, yeah. And you also uh, worked with something called Women Women for Wine. Oh Sense. yeah, I joined Women for Wine. Well, first I edited the uh, the um, the brochure. It was a little little brochure. I, mm -hmm. um, what is it? Discover Oregon wineries, and uh, so I did that for two or three years, which put me in contact with uh, many of the wineries because people each winery uh, drew wrote their own description, and, and I got on the road, went around and collected them, and we put together the maps. And uh, um, there was a vineyard owner, and again, uh, names are, I miss, are escaping me. He was an art teacher at, in, at PCC, so he, he was, did the, oh, nice. put, put the, uh, nice. anyway. Uh, it, it, and the, then I joined Women for Wine Sense. And what exactly was that? Well, that was, <clears throat> for an organization formed by a, a lot of women in the wine industry in California, and it was a time when there were ballot initiatives being introduced in state after state after state, much like we've seen uh, in some other social issues. And the effect would have been to get the wine industry to put itself out of business. It was just ma major anti-alcohol. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, atmosphere all across the country and so Women for Wine Sense was uh, a way to counteract that and we were going to um, do a speakers bureau to and the message uh, because there are you know rotary clubs and all kinds of organizations that need a, need programs and we thought okay this is a way to get a message out so the message was going to be a little wine is good but if you cannot or will not keep your consumption moderate, then you should not consume any. And we thought that was pretty forward thinking, you know, for an alcohol industry. Well, I wrote, the, so I was active in, in Women for Wine Sense and met, uh, and um, Maria Ponzi was, and, mm -hmm. and Helen Duchet, and a number of, of the women in the Willamette Valley were active in it. I think it still exists, but uh, but it's I think it's pretty much a tasting group that I, I don't know. Um, I got exhausted after I managed <laughs> the, the, the national convention because it wasn't really national. I mean, there was Oregon and California, maybe a little bit in Washington, a few folks in New York, maybe it was. Hmm. So I don't know about the health, but but it was it was a great. Uh, uh, Organization to, to network and meet mm -hmm. people and how so was how was your message received your, the the message of it never got the, the the speakers bureau never got off the ground uh. I spent a year researching it and I was exhausted I, I said okay ladies here it is this is a script do what you will with it and nobody did anything mm. with it and it, it, but but I learned about a lot about wine when I did it and it was a time be, before the message was required to be on the bottle that pregnant women should not consume mm -hmm. alcohol. And at that time, uh, let's see, I used resources from California, the Wine Institute in California, and, and they had things about uh, wine and breast cancer. That, I mean, that, that there was no connection, and, and it was so, who knows? Science is what it is, and sometimes <laughs> you get a different message after. <laughs> Yeah. A while, but my younger daughter was pregnant right right about that time. 
with her first child, and she took that very seriously. Should not drink wine at all. And so they were down for Thanksgiving, and, and I had some fruit wine, raspberry wine. And I grew up with it, and I went, so, oh, and I said, you've got, you've, you've got to sm at least smell this. It's just like you're in a raspberry patch. She would not even smell it. <laughs> uh, we, we joke about it. She laughs today. <laughs> but she did have a perfect child. It's, it's, yeah, it's I mean, it all you can't out. argue with the results. <laughs> uh, so you, you talked a little bit about, about marketing. Uh, yeah. And, and you, were, you guys were in the industry right as Oregon was sort of developing its first marketing plans. So, so were you involved in that or, or what was your impression? Well, because we, we didn't have wine to sell, we didn't fuss with it too much. Um, that was for somebody else to worry about. And, and we are, that's after our foray into wine that didn't turn out too well. And I had been in sales earlier. I had, I had done a stint, maybe 10 years, with Mary Kay Cosmetics. Mm -hmm. Thought I knew a lot about sales and marketing. Uh, Again, while it was new, it was Mary who? <laughs> it, now it's every, you know, everyone right. knows the name, but it, nobody knew the name then. And I, I thought I was just smarter than all get out about marketing. But um, we, didn't ha we decided if you have a winery, you're, you're selling all the time. And, and that was the last thing Dick was going to do. So uh, that, didn't, that didn't fit our, our lifestyle. Sure. We were happy growing grapes. Sure and peaches and cherries <laughs> and plums and beans. <laughs> I had a very, very productive uh, garden and orchard there. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and what we didn't eat, uh, I mean, I, I mean, my degree is home economics. I, I do that stuff. And um, so I froze it and I, I tell people I have advanced training in freezer management. <laughs> um, I just took it in the food bank, and I, I counted up one year. I took in like 160 pounds of food to the food bank. It was. It's incredible. Yeah, yeah, because both of us, as children, were in poor families, and uh, the thought of I mean, there are lots, there are a lot of worthy causes, mm -hmm. but um, to have people go hungry is the worst thing to think about and so the food bank was our pretty much our major charity and we could see that there wasn't a lot of bureaucracy in between the receiver and, and the mm -hmm. organization yeah it was I forget what the question was <laughs> We were talking about marketing, but that was a long marketing. time. That was a long time ago. Yeah, we. I, I didn't concern myself with marketing. I just, I, I was always interested in it, and I, I heard the, the people talking, and and the organ industry just hung together because the first job was to get anybody out of the Northwest to know where Oregon is, and that it's not Oregon, <laughs> and that it's not Willamette. It's the Willamette. Um, so everybody worked together to uh, get the the state name recognized. Mm -hmm. And after we got them here, and I, I think the Bethel Heights people were very, very active in that. Mm -hmm. the, those, are, and I'm sure there are lots of others that I, I would count them the first wave. I don't know if they would. Um, the Ponzi's were busy, and uh, uh, Erath and mm -hmm. Adelsheim. I, I didn't really know those people. They they were the the, the the real pioneers. Yeah. yeah. So you saw a lot of changes in the industry. You were you owned your vineyard for twenty five years or so. Mm -hmm. uh, talk about some of the biggest changes you noticed, or the biggest things that were different when you sold. Oh, a, a lot more, a lot more acreage in grapes, a lot more small wineries, mm -hmm. um, and of and an effort uh, to, there was always concern that, that big, big companies would come in and buy up a lot of, because that's, that is the case in Washington. Mm -hmm. Saint, Saint Michel is, is the, the 
the big dog on the on the street. Mm -hmm. And um, at one point, I know Calpers invested in land, mm -hmm. and and that seemed to be like uh, the first crack in the door where there would be a lot of acquisition of by out of state companies. Mm -hmm. And uh, I don't think that has happened. I, I think all I see is, it, I may be naive, but I think it's just gotten more Oregon like it always was. Sm small, a, f a few large operations, mm -hmm. um, but uh, individuals doing their own thing, making craft wine. I, uh, I love Oregon because we drink, you know. <laughs> we, we have craft breweries. Stash tea started here. It started with Azo. We have coffee, and we have—I mean, we just drink a lot here, <laughs> which I think is great. <laughs> and and then there's a distillery. The uh, mm -hmm. do you know the name of the distillery? There's the big one in Hood, Hood River. Uh, yeah, I had. They uh, while I was doing the the brochure. Uh, Discover wineries, Oregon wineries, they asked whether they could be included in the brochure, and I didn't know, so I conferred with whoever I conferred with, and we thought, well, no, they're not really a wine. <laughs> so we said no, and I think that was a mistake. Uh, Clear Creek Distillery. That's the one. Is that right? It's, I believe that's right. I think that's right, yeah. And he was just starting. Um, I, th I think that was an error. We should have uh, had a bigger tent. Interesting to know where to draw the line. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's hard to say. Yeah, but he makes really, really tasty. <laughs> 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 so I I'm curious. Um, have you stayed at, stayed in touch with the industry at all since you retired? Have you kept up kept up with the the kind of the what's oh, yeah. happening? Oh yeah, yeah. Um, well, when we sold the vineyard, uh, we moved to uh, a golf course community, of course, and uh, we, we had bought the property in September because we knew we had a deal with Ken, but we hadn't solved all of, all of the financial details. And the people we, whose house we bought were building a new house, and it was at the top of the market. and. Uh, their house went up for sale by owner on a Thursday, and it was advertised on a Friday. By Sunday, they had four offers. So, I mean, those were the days. Mm -hmm. And we had offered them six months of free rent while they finished their house because it worked with us. And, and, and the, which other than that, we probably would have kept looking for someplace. Um, and so we moved in in April. Uh, and. I got pneumonia and I was sick, and through like most of the summer, I, yes. I developed an I had an allergy to the to the uh, antibiotic Oof. they treated me with, and so by it was kind of a lost year. In July, August, I I kept going in for blood tests. The, the initial uh, diagnosis was. Autoimmune hepatitis, and I thought, oh, I can't get that. <laughs> and, it, and it wasn't, it, it was this allergy to this medication. Mm. And so for six months I went in for blood tests and, and I, every, I got well, I got better. And, and then the next month, it, Dick was, watched a commercial and he said, I wonder if I have COPD. I never even knew he had trouble breathing. So I went into the doctor and uh, was diagnosed with stage four lung cancer and mm. so he by December he had passed away mm. and um, what was the question uh, sort of after you sold how you after, if you how, stayed in the right. industry so uh, it, the, and by that time this growers group was meeting at the clubhouse at McNary Estates and that was my, that was my support group av after I was widowed mm -hmm. so um, yeah I, I knew I met new people there and uh, people I'd known for a long time. So yeah, those those were the people that, that kept me going. That's really and, excellent. And really they nice. still do, yeah. That's really nice. Do you my have family. Any? Exactly. That's, that's, I, I have that's no what... relatives in the state. I'm, it's just me, so those, those are my family. 
But you know how they say, you can't pick your relatives, but you can pick your friends. <laughs> That's right. And you guys kind of grew up together. I mean, you grew up together in the industry. Uh, uh, yeah, a lot of them. Makes yeah. sense. Makes sense. Uh, uh, and, and most of them are, st st well, O'Connor's not, but, uh, and, and Al's retired, but uh, uh, most of them are still in the business. Uh, I think Duches are turning their operation over to their son. Mm -hmm. um, but they're still, they still have their aura. Uh, the Castiles that sort of are moving to the second generation, mm -hmm. but they're all very involved. It's a family corporation mm -hmm. and uh, mm, yeah, we split apart. Uh, people die and move on, but uh, those who are, most of, most of my old contacts are still in the business. Mm -hmm. And a lot of new ones. So the, the, it's very, I, th I just think it's wonderful to see new people come in and younger people because mm -hmm. farming is hard business and you, you really can't make a nickel on it. Uh, you, you, uh, you do it because you love the way, the lifestyle. I mean, who wouldn't turn down a 360 degree view? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, silence and and space to do what you want. It's it's a it's a great lifestyle. Plus the product's not too bad. Yeah, it's also, also I, nice. Yeah. I do enjoy the product. <laughs> and it was during the time I, I did the research for Women for Wine Sense was the first time I decided, well, I should have a glass of wine every day. But other than that, I I would and I at that point I it was Dick really preferred scotch. <laughs> But he, I mean, he drank, he, he, he didn't turn it down, he liked wine, but I, I would have what I call my cooking wine, and so I would sip on it while I was fixing dinner. And then we had milk to drink for dinner, and I never drank anything after that, so it was, um, uh, I, I worried for a while, it was, was I drinking too much? And, and I asked somebody one time, and they said, no. <laughs> Oh. oh, good grief! No, that's not. But it, alcoholism is a—it's is a, it's an occupational hazard, and I think people in the industry need to need to pay attention. And um, and I heard people who who had gone to France for marketing tours told of just really some some of the people in the in the French industry just really drink a lot, <laughs> and that. Th that uh, 60 Minutes program that came out, mm -hmm. um, the uh, the, para the the red wine the, paradox. Yeah, the French paradox. French paradox. That's right. W which was saying, look at they have this fatty diet and they drink all this wine and they have less heart disease than anybody in the world. They d they didn't mention that they also have a really high incidence of cirrhosis of the liver. So <laughs> it's, it's all it's, it's all. Moderation. Moderation. Everything in moderation. Even <laughs> moderation. Do you have any thoughts on sort of the future of the organ industry? Like what it's going to look like in the next 15, 20 years? Rich, I don't. I, I live right here right now. <laughs> I, I, I always have. An, I, it's, I don't know enough to project into the future. I, I like what the, where the industry is now. There are some some large players, some a lot of small players. They all get along. There's no divide between growers and, and winemakers. And it's it's. I I hope it just stays as congenial as it is, and the and the product is improving vastly. Mm -hmm. um, I know people outside of the industry, one in particular who used to be in the, in the, the restaurant industry, and, and, he, and he said, I don't really like Oregon wine there, but, you know, but he tasted it back in the 80s when there, were, there was a lot of flawed wine. And um, so the, the, the product has gotten better. Mm -hmm. and, and Oregon is maturing. Just the fact that there's the Chemeketa training program is is huge mm -hmm. and and yamhill carlton high school now teaches because those are farming communities mm -hmm. they they have 
a viticulture program in the high school. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Ken Wright, <laughs> for establishing that. Um, and and I would think that 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 should extend throughout the the valley where there are farming communities mm -hmm. and the people there like to work on that land. They have to learn to work with the crops that are grown. And um, so I think the industry is maturing. The, the, of course, the Shemekata program. Um, mm -hmm. It still looks like heaven to me. <laughs> I, I don't see uh, large, there, there, will, there will be some sales when people retire and they, they either don't want, either have no second generation to pass it on to or that's just, or the second generation isn't interested or they, mm -hmm. I mean, our first daughter uh, has a PhD in agronomy, and she, at one point she said, well, you know, Mom, Mom oh, the, the, the master's degree is soil science. And she said, you know, it's just acid soil management, Mother. <laughs> <laughs> but, and, I mean, she was all set to, to take over the vineyard, and, uh, and I said, you know, it, it's 80% 80, 80 fixing stuff that's broken. And, and, and she said, I can do that. <laughs> Um, so, uh, but her, her sister had no interest at all, and, so, and I said, honey, you, ca you can't afford to buy it, and w we can't afford to give it to you, so uh, that di ours didn't pass on at all yeah. for that reason. Yeah. And, uh, uh, but, but before we sold it, I checked with her to see where she was on, on the, uh, <laughs> and she was happy. She's a city planner now. Less, less dirty work that way. Yeah, you know? yeah. She deals with zoning and, yeah. So I, I think you've already basically answered this question, but the last question I have for you is, if you could do it all over again, would you? If you could. In a heartbeat. <laughs> In a heartbeat. It was the best. It, I, I mean, I was in my early 40s when we started. and. Um, we, the children were raised. We raised them in Phoenix, Arizona. But uh, the corporate life, we, we moved all over the country. And we settled in Oregon. The climate it was beautiful. I mean, I am a native Oregonian. I grew up in, in Pendleton. My, I had a sister who graduated from Willamette University. But then I went to college and left. Mm -hmm. and so, And growing up in eastern Oregon, I was and having coming over to visit my sister. It was always during the rainy season, and <laughs> I had no idea that the, the Willamette Valley has dry summers. I just assumed it rained all the time <laughs> on the west side of the mountains. <laughs> so, so, uh, it, it's those were the best years. I, I mean, the best is yet to come, but those were great years. Of course, I, I think I'm genetically happy. Um, <laughs> Phoenix was great. I never thought I'd le le leave Phoenix either. I've, so who knows? It, it was yeah. I'd do it. I might do it differently, but I, probably not. It, I, the, the way it worked out, it was terrific. I had a great time. Good, wonderful. Yeah, yeah. I recommend it. <laughs> but you, I mean, you have to be to to live a farm life. And I, and I, I now I say I'm a farm girl, but really I love cities, and I, I lived in cities prior to that a lot of it. Um, you have to be flexible, and my my father, who had the growing gene in him, and him grew up in what was then free water, not it, before it became Milton free mm -hmm. water. And he always, I was at his elbow all the time. He, he grew, he had a great garden. He gave me a seed. We had a little house and a big lot and half of it was garden and half of it was chickens. And so we had fresh eggs and fresh chicken and, and, and uh, he gave me a handful of wheat that we, and he said, go, go plant this. I, I think, I, I know I was a preschooler and I was always playing in the mud and so I, Put it in, and I'd seen him plant things. He told me how to plant the radishes and how to plant the lettuce, and I couldn't do the lettuce, but I could put in the peas. And uh, <laughs> so I knew how to plant. And within a week, 
it sprouted, and I went, <laughs> oh, <laughs> so I was hooked. <laughs> and, um, but he always said, if you're going to be a farmer, don't grow a crop that eats, as in animals, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. And he, he didn't live to see the vineyard. I always wondered what he would think of it. He'd be pretty happy. Yeah, the, the O'Briens started their vineyard right about the same time. And uh, they, they're social, but they, they had... Dick was a teacher, and they had this, you know, this annual St. Patrick's Day party. And but she had been with the Girl Scouts. She'd been with the Lama. She, she, they, they, they were like 60, 70 people would come, and some of them were were grape growers. But the, I know they started coming to the meetings, the grape, the growers meetings mm -hmm. at the same time we did. And um, so I know I was leading up to something. When Dick passed away just recently, I, I shared something. Oh, I remember that her, her father passed away. Mm -hmm. And I remembered how I felt when my dad died. And uh, so I wrote quite a note to her about uh, how would her... I mean, they named it their vineyard for, for, her, for her parents. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, I don't, and, and now she, her husband has died. So I, I've got Betty interviewed me for a job that I was had no qualifications for while she was uh, head of the Girl Scouts. Or yeah, and and then within a month they showed up at the vineyard at the, at the grape growers meeting. She didn't remember me, and it's only recently I reminded her of the fact that she <laughs> <laughs> she failed to hire me for this, which was good because I didn't know anything. I figured I could I could figure it out on the job. It was how to write grants. Oh my goodness gracious! And uh, you know I had this marketing background, and <laughs> and and my my daughter had a girlfriend or, or a roommate, and and she was still in, in college and. Uh, her roommate wrote grants, and so I thought, well, I mean, how hard can it be? I can figure it out. <laughs> that's wonderful. I love it. I love it. Well, that's all the questions I have for you. Oh. Is there anything else you'd like to say or anything I should have asked that I didn't? I think I've probably gossiped as much as I need to. <laughs> Well, it's it's a wonderful industry and the people in it are wonderful and and the and the product is just getting better and better. Good. Good. And I'm so pleased that that this history is being preserved. Yes. Yes, yeah, so but are it we. It does make me feel fairly <laughs> ancient to be giving living history. <laughs> it's a living archive. We have we have living this, archive. This, yes. This, no no yes. age requirements back here. Right. So I I hope your your efforts are more widely Dis disseminated, and so you get many contributions. Me too. Me too. Um, settling into my new house, um, it dawned on me I didn't have to hang everything that I, every image that I have, and so it's it's I, I'm happy to bring things here. Excellent. Yes. Yeah. Well, we'd love to have them. Yeah. Well, okay. thank thank you so much for your time.